on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. There's abundance everywhere. Always something to be found. You have to get a little creative sometimes. When I think about Native peoples living on that landscape, the foods there are incredible, but they're so sparse and it's such an intense place. I had been learning mushrooms for a while and it took several years to eat that first wild one and be like, are you sure? You really know what you're doing. Vitamin D goes in all the milk and, you know, iodine goes in all the salt and, you know, we have fluoride in all the water and it's like, none of this stuff helping. Let's try these mushrooms because I notice everybody comes out like, I get it now. (laughs) You know, like for like at least a week and a half, they totally get it. That is one of the draws to the world of mushrooms. There's all of these new discoveries being made and new species and people can actually take part in that themselves. It's not relegated just to the scientists. And then you can have dinner too. Episode 101 of the Wild Fed Podcast, A Forager's Wanderland with Jess Starwood is brought to you by Sir Thrival. When I started Sir Thrival back in 2008, my goal was to create a supplement line devoted to the world I believed was coming. One where immune systems would be challenged, hormone levels would be suppressed, and our ability to adapt would be limited by the chemical and electromagnetic pollution that was becoming a constant. And I believed that nature held the answers. One of the first product lines I developed was our medicinal mushroom dual extracts. Medicinal mushrooms like reishi and chaga have both been shown in scientific studies again and again to be powerful adaptogens and immune system modulators. They help your body adapt to the challenging new health landscape, and they fortify your immune system against new and existing threats. In fact, they're beta-glucans. Those are complex, non-sweet, non-glycemic sugar molecules. Make your immune system more intelligent, improving your white blood cells' ability to clean up unwanted biological intruders and your body's own wayward cells. Sir Thrival's chaga is made from wild chaga mushrooms, and Sir Thrival's reishi is made with organic wood-grown fruit bodies. Both are extracted in alcohol and hot water for a full-spectrum product like no other. Right now, and all through September at SirThrival.com, our reishi and chaga mushroom dual extracts are 20% off with the coupon code ADAPTNOW. Head over to SirThrival.com and use the coupon code ADAPTNOW for 20% off all mushroom products at SirThrival.com. I get to travel a lot, and when I tell people that I'm from Maine, they always tell me how much they love Maine lobsters. I always tell them about MaineLobsterNow.com. Nothing's healthier than fresh seafood that came right off the dock. Now you can bring fresh, natural seafood home no matter where you live with MaineLobsterNow.com. Maine Lobster Now ships fresh, live lobsters. I repeat, these are still living lobsters. Overnight, right to your door anywhere in the country, and they come with excellent and simple cooking instructions. They've also got fresh lobster tails, full lobster roll kits, colossal Alaskan king crab legs, which I ordered some of, and they're incredible, scallops, mussels, and a wide assortment of fresh fish. Use the coupon code WILDFEDLOBSTER for $10 off your first order at MainLobsterNow.com. Demand more from your seafood and experience Maine lobsters delivered right to your door with MainLobsterNow.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Jess Starwood is an herbalist, forager, chef, and the author of the new book, Mushroom Wanderland. Being on opposite coasts, I've only known Jess through the exquisite photography and ecologically inspired writing featured on her beautifully curated social media pages. With her new book getting the attention of the foraging community, and with so many requests to have her on the show, this seemed like a great time to finally connect with her to learn more about the important impact she's having on modern wild food culture. But just a quick reminder first, you can now watch the Wild Fed TV show on MyOutdoorTV.com. They offer a free trial, so if you just want to check out all 10 episodes of Season 1, that's a great way to do it. I've just returned from Florida making an episode for Season 2, and I'm getting ready to head out to Standing Rock in the Dakotas to make an episode about bison and chokecherry. So keep an eye out for that. Season 2 will premiere on the Outdoor Channel in early 2022. Now, without further ado, here's my interview with Jess Starwood. Jess Starwood, welcome to the show. Hi, so glad to be here. You know, I, from time to time, reach out to my audience and I say, like, who would you like to have on the show? And I consistently 
get your name coming back <laughs> at us. So it's good to have you here finally. And um, I'm just kind of getting to know your work a little bit, but um, wow, your Instagram account. It's like, <laughs> it's almost like, isn't that what Instagram was supposed to be for? It's beautiful. It's really, really well curated. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, who, is that your photography? It is. Yeah, I do all of my own work. Um, I mean, I love to collaborate, but you know, my, my photography, my work, that's that's all me. It's really, really well done. Wow, your your eye for uh, photography is amazing. Um, could you tell us a little bit about all the kind of different things that you've got going on? I know you have a book coming out. Um, looks like you do a lot of kind of foraging type workshops and stuff like that. But tell, give us a little synopsis of who you are and what you do. Uh, yeah, I started out as an herbalist, and you know, I've, I studied intensely in herbalism for a long time. Um, I have a master's degree in herbal medicine. And I do teach still a lot of herbalism classes, but uh, that path kind of led me into foraging and wild food. And I had always had a love for food and, but not just any food, but food that looks good. And so with my background of um, art and photography and design, I kind of brought that into into my work and um and then that kind of has led to to my book um my uh, mushroom book and but i love teaching as well and sharing everything about nature with people through through the visual side of you know hey it can look good or you know just everyone uh, helping people cultivate their own um connection with with uh their food and, and the wild. And you're in, are you in Ojai? You're in Southern California? I'm in Southern California for the most part. I travel quite extensively, um, but I am, I am tied to Southern California because I, I have my kids part-time. Um, but the rest of the time I'm, I'm out and about. And last year I traveled all over the country uh, photographing mushrooms uh, for my book. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. When did you, you know, what was your initial foray into wild foods and, and plants? Was it when you started to get into herbalism or, you know, does it come from somewhere else? Um, as a kid, I was absolutely fascinated with the idea of running away and living in the wild. I... <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, the thing is, though, I grew up in the Sonoran Desert uh, in Phoenix, oh, oh, and okay. the wild was a little bit harsh, different <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> than what I would read in my books and yeah. fantasize about. So uh, it wasn't until a little bit later on, after my first daughter was born, that I just had this just sudden drive to learn about food and going back to the wild and what the wild can offer us uh, through food. And uh, it just started from there. I mean, well, it, it was rekindled at that point and, and haven't stopped. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I love Arizona in general. Um, Spent a lot of time there and I think about, that you know, I've done a lot of foraging on that landscape, not so much hunting, but the when I think about native peoples living on that landscape, you know, whether it's like the Apache or the Tahona Odom or something like that, like the the foods there are incredible, but they're so sparse and it's such an intense place. And then, you know, talking about Southern California, which feels to me like almost anything can grow there. Huh? It's like, I mean, it's just so diverse. There's so many species. Obviously, a lot of them have been brought there, but but you've kind of gone now to a place that's like sort of America's garden in a way, huh? <laughs> a bit. Uh, this year, I mean, I'm in Southern California, which is getting pretty dry. Uh, yeah. This year was, we had no rain. Um, I literally have not found a single edible mushroom this season, yeah, okay. which normally I find a good, decent amount, but um strangely dry very very dry this year um and it's you know it's part of something though that i teach in my classes is that there there's abundance everywhere you know and even looking into the desert um there's there is something to always something to be found you have to get a little creative sometimes but Mm -hmm. um 
it's it's good to push those creative edges and see what you can do and come up with but there's always something any favorite desert foods um i love saguaro fruit yeah and <laughs> very few people that, have tasted that one right when you bring that up people are like huh yeah yeah um that's definitely one of my favorites i also really love um ironwood beans oh i've never had it yeah those are they produce a quite a large sized bean um and they they're real nutty real almost buttery really love them and everybody i've served them to just just adores them they're they cook like really a legume tasty. or a nut yeah it's a legume mm -hmm. um so it's it kind of has a nutty taste to it, it feels like you're eating a nut um but they're really nice roasted and a little bit of salt and they're Mm, perfect. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like some jojoba if I can get my hands on it. And definitely oh, mesquite. Yeah. I really love eating mesquite. Uh, there's just so yeah. many cool plants in the desert. But um, when and for you, when did you become involved in mycology? Because, you know, I have this joke going like the listeners right now are like rolling their eyes because they hear me talk about this all the time. But, you know, <laughs> I always say to hunters like like hunting is a very easy wild food pursuit in the sense. I mean, there's a lot of challenges to it, but there's no I always go like, hey, there's no poisonous lookalike deer. And then you start getting into plants and obviously there's, you know, you have to understand things a little bit more, but not like when you get into the realm of mushrooms where, you know, a person <laughs> could conceivably harm themselves if they ignorantly started to eat fungi off the landscape. And so I have found that as you traverse through those worlds, the world of mycology is filled with people I find to be, I, I hate saying this, but it's like really high IQ individual, high IQ individuals because they're having to understand the Latin and they're having to really be able to parse the details of mycology to safely navigate that world. And no other, no other discipline do I find people speaking as much Latin as I do in the world of mycology. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely um, a complex world to get into for sure. And um, I remember probably about six or seven years ago, maybe now, um, I had I had been learning mushrooms for a while, and I think I it took several years to eat that first wild one and be like, "Are you sure you really oh, know what you're doing?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, yeah, it just took a long time to get that confidence. But um, I was, you know, I took it as a challenge. It's like I I want to know. I want to know all mm. of these and. So I wrote a book about it <laughs> and I think there's, you know, no better way to really know a subject um, other than to, you know, just go so deep into it that, you know, you can at the end of the day, write a book. And um, I mean, you know, mushrooms, they do require that respect to know, you know, what you can and can't eat. Um, but there's easy ones though out there for, you know, folks who are just getting into it to, um, to try some out, you know, that have only very few lookalikes and, or, you know, not at all, like chicken of the woods is a pretty easy one yeah, to, yeah. to start out with. And, um, you know, when people, I find that when people do recognize, you know, they're able to identify and then have the confidence to eat one, the, um, they're, they're just, they're hooked. They're amazed that like, wow, this is, it's possible. Something yeah. that seems so, you know, too big to understand. Uh, and then they get that first step into it and it just completely opens up everything. Yeah. Mycology is weird though, too, because it's like still an emerging field in a sense. Like it's not all, it's like not, not everything has been named yet. And, you know, there's like undiscovered species still, which is a really unusual thing in biology. But, um, I do want to say about chicken of the woods too. I find, um, when you get into a good one, I mean, sometimes you've got like days worth of food and right. that's like such a life changer for people. You know, when you bring somebody out and you go like, well, this is edible and they nibble on it, but they don't, you know, it's like, um, what would be an example? I don't, I don't know, like some chicory or something like that, where you're like, yeah, okay. I see that that's edible, but I'm not going to bring home like a, you know, 20 pounds of this. Uh, <laughs> realistically, you know, it's more like it's cool to know and it's a, something you might throw in your salad or cook a little of, but you get like a good sized chicken of the woods and you bring that home and that's like a game changer. You're like, oh man, I could like, 
I could really like eat this and live on this. Like it's substantial. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it just really changes people's perspective. And, and like you said, it's a, an emerging field. Um, and I think that is also a big, uh, draw for people because, you know, we know so much about the natural world already. We've explored, you know, most of the whole planet. We, there's not too many new, you know, frontiers to explore. So with mycology, the idea that there's all of these new discoveries being made and new species and it's, and people can actually take part in that themselves. It's not, you know, relegated just to the scientists or just to, um, people with edu- you know, high back- educational backgrounds, it, it can be for anybody. Anybody out walking around in the wo- woods can potentially stumble upon something new and exciting. So that I think is you know, really pretty awesome. And then you can have dinner too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's so much better than a hobby, like just walking or hiking or something. Cause you like bring something home with you, which is, I love watching when yeah. people are foraging mushrooms when when somebody finds a choice specimen, some kind of choice edible, like the way they always shout something out <laughs> and get so excited, like little <laughs> kids, you know, which I just don't see as much of that in plant foraging. I'll be like, oh, good blueberries over here, guys. But when you find a mushroom, and it's like, <laughs> ah! you know, everybody's yelling. It's very exciting. Is your book actually out yet or is it um, still to be released? It's going to be out on August 17th this year. Yeah, so must still really a few excited. more months to go. Yeah. How's the journey been? It was pretty smooth, although I, at first when I got my contract uh, last year at the um, in March of 2020, you know, things all of a sudden shut down and um, my publisher, well, initially I was supposed to be writing a, just a general wild food cookbook and my publisher at the last minute said, um, no, we want a book about mushrooms. And I said, uh, okay, I can do that. But <laughs> I, all of my photos were all, mm-hmm. you know, wild foods and lots of plants and herbs and all of that. And we had just, you know, March is pretty much the end of our mushroom season in California or oh, Southern California. Okay. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm getting on the road and I have all of these mushrooms to photograph because I had spent, you know, the last... 10 years photographing food (laughs) and (laughs) you know maybe you know some photos on my phone you know like my phone photos I'm like that's not good enough I need to get out there and and luckily I found you know nearly all of the mushrooms I was I featured in my book um there was a I had to have a couple friends pitch in a few but otherwise yeah I spent uh six months going you know, back and forth across the country. Whereabouts did you go? I, I just picture the Pacific Northwest for some reason. That's like where I think of mushroom density, but obviously that's not the whole story. Right. Yeah. I was up there a little bit. Um, I got a few things there, but I spent probably the most amount of time in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Where would you go in Maine? Um, let's see. I stayed initially with a friend near um, Portland. Oh, no kidding. Um, yeah. And then I was up and down the coast, um, and then met up with another forager, a couple of foragers actually, who helped turn me on to their spots and, and like, like their secret spots that they don't mm-hmm. share their, <laughs> with the locals. Yeah, and I was like, right. totally scored. Um, I ate very well that time I was out there. That was fantastic. And yeah, most of my mushroom photos are from, from that trip. And the book is called Mushroom Wanderland, correct? Yes. I love the title. A Forager's Guide to Finding, Identifying, and Using More Than 25 Wild Fungi. Well, congratulations. I'm excited to add it to my library, um, particularly because your photography is so good. So that'll be really nice. Um, Thanks. Our, yeah, our season, it's interesting when you said that because when we have some spring mushrooms, we tend to have, you know, we have some stuff in the summer, but primarily it kind of shuts down. And then for me, I think like fall, September is like where we really start to have mushrooms here. So it's interesting here. You guys have primarily like a wet and dry season there then? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, either wet or dry. And this year it's been pretty much only dry. So um, yeah, there's a, a short window um, between say January through 
March at the latest, um, you know, on a, on a regular year, but um, this year, yeah, we just barely got anything. Um, I was lucky just to f get a few oyster mushrooms um, at the very beginning, but, but that was it. Um, but yeah, Southern California is not the best place for uh, foraging mushrooms, but I'm... Is it going to keep you there? <laughs> Um, a lot of people leaving that area, huh? I got a so, lot. All my know, friends have left there. I mean, they're all either in Texas or they're in Florida right now. Same here. Literally, all of my friends except for one has left so far, and I'm like, "What? Where's everybody going?" <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, I'm I am stuck here till my or not stuck, and I'm I'm choosing to be here until my children are yeah. old enough. So. That's a good choice. You got to think yeah, about the their kids dad is like, <laughs> Their dad is just set to be here. So, yeah. okay, here we yeah. are. I've often felt like um, California is like one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. You know, I mean, it's just incredible, mm -hmm. but just it's such an intense place to be as well. You know, so there's like, there's like the social landscape and then there's the natural landscape. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they're like two different things. And it's like always trying to find a place where the social and the natural landscapes kind of work for you know, for me or whatever, but I'm kind of the same thing up here in Maine. There's a lot of access. We don't have to so many things that are going on in the country. So I sort of look out from here sometimes like, Oh, <laughs> I wish we had that. <laughs> but, uh, how about, and on the botany side, so herbalism is a big piece for you too, then. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, especially with there being such a short mushroom season here, then my attention is obviously focused a lot more on all the plants. Um, and the herbalism side as well, you know, I, I had a, um, I had a company up until just before 2020, um, I was doing, I had an apothecary, I was making a full range of products and, and you know, all herbal products and serving the community. Um, it, that was quite a passion, but, but it. I wanted people to empower themselves and to learn how to make things themselves. Um, you know, it's, it's a strange world between, you know, buying products that are made from wild foods as opposed to um, going out there and collecting it yourself and being part of the process. Um, so I shifted over into um, teaching more and, you know, connecting people with the plants themselves, doing workshops and, helping people realize that they can do it themselves and empowering, you know, them with the knowledge to, to do that. I often feel with herbal medicine that, you know, people want to use it like allopathic medicine. So yeah. it's sort of like, how much do I take? How many times a day do I take it? And obviously that's part of the equation, but it often feels like, oh, you're kind of missing. Well, I want to get your feedback on this. Kind of how I see it is like, part of it's the relationship with the plants, part of the healing process. So when you never see the plant or if it's like, let's say it's encapsulated, you never actually even taste the plant, you don't know what the plant looks like. Yes, those phytochemicals are in there and they do seem in isolation to have some benefit in a scientific sense when we look at studies and research. But to me, when you go out into the environment of that plant, you meet it on its own terms in the place where it's rooted and you develop a personal relationship to me, that's like this big component of the healing. And so I think trying to take it like we take pills, you know, pharmaceutical pills is like sort of missing it, you know, which wouldn't be true of allopathy. Like I can't imagine you'd be like, you know, for allopathic medicine to work, you got to go to the laboratory and you got to go to the factory in the Philippines and actually see it. But with right. plant medicine, I really think like people are missing something if they don't get to meet the plant. At least, you know, I mean, I know sometimes we're taking stuff from other places and it's not possible, but, but wow, does the relationship seem to matter to me? I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's, it's tough to change that perspective a lot of times, um, at least I've seen with, with some clients where they, they just want to take something like they have an issue and they just want that Band-Aid to take care of it. Then. Mm -hmm. But it's, there's more to the story. There's more, um, you know, what's going on in the whole holistic sense, you know, what imbalances in the body are causing this problem, this symptom. And, you know, that's why we go to herbal medicine is because, you know, it, these 
plants work um, synergistically with our body to help um, to help you know find our, our balance again and by developing relationships with the plants themselves you know you see what's what it is where it's growing you know where it's growing um, and get to know it and then bringing it into your body there's already that relationship that has started before it even enters your body physically mm-hmm. um, you know and I hear time and time again about how a lot of times our the medicinal plants that we need are actually growing right near us um, you know somebody with liver issues may have a garden full of dandelions that they just keep trying to get rid of all these dandelions mm-hmm. but actually that's the medicine that your body's needing. Um, you know, there's so much that we don't understand, you know, in a scientific sense of the natural world, but you, you just can't quantify it in a, a scientific study or research. It's just something out, you know, you know, it's, you know, I hate to say like plant spirits, but it's, there's this energy exchange that um, you're in Southern California. Aware. You can say plant spirits. <laughs> I feel like I I have to be scientific and um know, you know, know not too crazy but It's tough cuz it's like they science has like a bit of a stranglehold on our psychology these days, you know? And it's like I often think about how it's like if you think about like um 3D glasses, you know? You got like a red lens and a blue lens, like a right wing and a left wing. Like everybody's always like wants to be right wing or left wing. It's like, dude, planes have two wings, birds have two wings. Like a right one and a left right. one. You kind of need both to stay afloat. Like to have depth perception and to see the world accurately, you need two eyeballs that have slight like an inch and a half apart perception mm-hmm. of things, you know what I mean? And so I think like having science is so important, but also having like a mystical side is also important. And I don't see how we can be whole with just the scientific paradigm, but it has such a stranglehold on everything such that right. we spend so much time trying to fit plants into the plant medicine, into the scientific paradigm. And we can to a degree, but there's this like kind of magic component that is just like, I have never heard anybody be like, you know what? Like I was sick and pharmaceuticals just showed up in my lawn. Like never heard of that. <laughs> But all the time people tell you about a plant that has never been there that's suddenly there. You know, you use dandelions as an example, which is, you know, a more common plant. But sometimes you hear from people stuff showing up that you're like, wow, I mean, that's really unusual that that would have showed up there like that. And it's never been in your yard and you've lived there a decade. Um, And I don't know how to explain that. I guess like, and you know, it's like we don't really need to explain it. I think trying to explain it might be takes take away from it a little bit. But yes, it's hard, I think, with herbalism because there's it's I don't know that it's all science or if it is it's like some of it's science maybe we don't fully understand I don't know what do you think about that right yeah yeah definitely um and speaking from just personal experience uh just spending time in nature you know is healing in a of a of itself you know and yeah um I see that people have such a disconnection nowadays that they just don't even understand how the seasons affect them and how how the different plants around them affect them and that you know spraying all of your weeds is actually causing you know more <laughs> problem than than benefit um other than maybe your your neighbors might not complain so much um it's yeah it's just kind of an upside down world for sure Yeah. And and humans have just gotten so utterly lonely in the sense that they just know so few species. Like one of the benefits of herbalism is suddenly you start meeting or, you know, foraging mushrooms or plants or whatever it is, you suddenly start meeting all these other species. And it's like, hey, we're, you're earth, you're an earthling too. (laughs) It's like good to meet you. You know what I mean? Like we're like living on earth, like as if we're the only ones here, you know, or I sometimes will joke like, yeah, plus our dogs, cats, and you know, a handful of like domestic species. But we, we often, you know, I, I like how something like herbalism is one of those pathways back to the natural world Uh, because it's like once you start down that road it's like good luck coming out of there you start to realize (laughs) like like that we're living a little bit wrong here you know or a lot bit wrong anyway right yeah i think that's really fascinating um did you mention that in your book i was watching an interview with you did you mention that you cover uh psilocybin mushrooms in there 
I do. Yes. And and I heard you say psilocybe, which I just want to congratulate you on because <laughs> you're the. I only know one other person who pronounces it correctly. And what I find is when you say psilocybe, everyone thinks you're saying it wrong. And it's like, no, you guys have been saying it wrong. <laughs> like I didn't even. <laughs> so that's cool. How did you learn that? <laughs> um, I actually I don't. I think somebody else said it that way, and I was like, oh, that makes sense. And you know, with Latin, I <laughs> I do have kind of a hesitation to say Latin words out loud because people just say them differently. You know, I don't mm-hmm. know if it's where where they're from or how they you know learned to pronounce uh, words or I I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, Latin names are. They're challenging, but there are some, yeah. there's some rules to it though, right? It's like, I have a botanist friend who's like, he's the one who brought it up to me. He's like, listen, we're, we're violating the rules of Latin when we say psilocybin. It's just not pronounced that way. And I was like, are you sure? Because I've never heard anyone say psilocybin ever. And he's like, no, I'm telling you, like, I'm, this is correct. But, but he's like, if you say it like that, everyone's going to think you're, you're saying it wrong. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. But. Uh, One of the things I've noticed, too, I was talking before about differences between the foraging for plant world and differences between that and the mushroom world. Have you found that when you go into the world of mycology, you meet far more people who have played with entheogenic mushrooms than when you're in the foraging world or botany world? You don't, I find I don't find as many people who are into plants who've used entheogenic plants as I do mushroomers who have tried (laughs) philosophy (laughs) mushrooms. Have you noticed that? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that is one of the draws to the world of mushrooms uh, is, is the entheogenic species that, you know, and that curiosity of, of, Hey, maybe I can get some answers to to <laughs> life and mm-hmm. um, more meaning. And I think we all, as you know, humans have that desire to to want to understand more and, and um, you know, see things maybe in a different way that we've been kind of stuck in. Yeah, um, it definitely makes your mind more plastic. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and really, if you know, in general, people could adopt a different mindset that, you know, we're all in this together. We all play a a specific part um, and very important part to just this life on earth, you know. Um, We could be in a better situation than we are now. Yeah, if we could uh, sort of, you know, you look at like some of the things like, we fortify the world with like vitamin D goes in all the milk and, you know, iodine goes in all the salt and, you know, we have right. flor- fluoride in all the water. And it's like, none of this stuff's helping. Like, can we try, <laughs> let's try these mushrooms. Cause I notice every time everybody comes out saying the same thing, you know, like everybody comes out, like I get it now, <laughs> you know, like yeah. for like at least a week and a half, they totally get it. It's like, <laughs> we need more of that going on. How have do, you, uh, yeah. how have you seen uh, COVID affect um, people's interest? in herbalism, wild foods, wild mushrooms, things like that? I feel like it has exploded. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen more people out in nature than I've ever seen before. I see people on the trails. I see, um, I'm just seeing so much more attention and activity um, and interest in wild foods and foraging, um, especially at the beginning when everybody was really locked down and, and they suddenly had to think about, oh, where am I going to get my food if I can't go to the store? And I think that really woke up a lot of people and made them, you know, curious to, or not curious, but they like needed to know this information that, oh, it actually is important to know that I could go out into my backyard and go find something to eat if my, you know, the stores are empty. Um, so I think that was a big wake up call for a lot of people. And, and then now, you know, those people who did look into foraging and wild foods, they're now kind of getting more into it and going further with it, which I think it's great. I think, um, learning about, you know, wild foods is, is good. Uh, we just have to remember that there's a sustainability and ethical part of it too. Um, that, you know, there's a lot of people in the world and for all of us to go out to the wild and, um, 
start grabbing whatever we can grab can can have a, a big impact too. So I think it's great, but we need to make sure we're all staying on the same page as far as um, sustainability and ethical practices too. It's uh, It reminds me of what we just talked about with allopathy because it's like we're in an allopathic mentality. So when we come to herbalism, we bring that mentality. And, you know, here where we're in this consumer culture, where we mm-hmm. don't really think about where things come from, how much there actually is, how sustainable is it to do? There's so many veils between us and the source of the thing. So then we go into the natural world, we bring those same that same attitudinal approach and then um, don't mean to be exploitative. I, I think most people, if you ask them, hey, do you want to exploit this environment like in a <laughs> negative way? They'd say no, but maybe right. they don't realize. Um, do you have any thoughts on sustainable foraging you want to share or anything like that? Because I'd be curious, your, uh, especially where you're working with individuals, like how you how you communicate that. Because I, I have found like the other thing people often, I know, I know you experience this, like you must. Well, two things I'll say. The first one, maybe you experience. You ever have critics who go like, well, Jess, not everybody can be a forager. There's 7 billion people in the world, so it's not like everyone can do it. And I'm always like, I'm not trying to say that 7 billion people need to do it. I'm not, this is just my thing. I'm just doing my thing. Like, you know, people who golf aren't trying to get all 7 billion people in the world to play golf. I don't know why, you know. Or do you have people who ever say that to you? Oh, I do. I sure do. We'll get back to the show in a moment. But first, the Wild Fed Podcast is proudly sponsored by Red Kill Mountain Homestead Farms. Red Kill Mountain in upstate New York is home to the state's largest wild apple savanna. This unique ecotone boasts thousands of seed-grown feral apple trees on a pristine spring water-fed mountainside overlooking the Delaware River Valley. Unlike the grafted cloned apples you buy in the store, that's right, even organic apples are genetic clones. Red Kill Mountain apples are different. Just like nature and Johnny Appleseed intended, all the apples there are born from seed. This means that the apples you get from Red Kill are from unnamed varieties, varieties you never tasted before, and they've never been sprayed or even irrigated. These are truly organic, natural fruits. Red Kill Mountain hand selects apples and gently packs them in boxes to ship directly to your door. While these apples would make great hard cider or other apple products, Ashley and Matthew believe they are best enjoyed simply eaten. That's why they've created their Wild Apple Tasting Box and their Wild Apple Cleanse Kit. When you order, you'll receive carefully chosen apples from a variety of trees while they're in the peak of their ripeness. Go over to redkillmountain.com to check out their apples and other products too, like their limited run apple molasses, their bourbon barrel maple syrup, and more. The coupon code WILDFED10 gets you 10% off the best, most natural apples you've ever tasted at redkillmountain.com. Now, back to the show there's um definitely (laughs) some backlash i get of you know how dare you uh go out and pick plants and um how dare you you know teach people to go out and forage and steal from the land and you know i do get it there's like we said there's billions of people on this planet and if every single person went out to go forage it would not, it not would not work. Um, but however, you know, education is super important. It's if people people care about what they know, people care about what they know about, and if they know that there's valuable valuable food, valuable plants and mushrooms, and in, the environment is worth saving, they're going to have you know a a stance to want to protect it. Um, you know, if you think that out there, uh, is, is just wild, it's just nature. We can use it however we want, um, you know, plow it down and build a shopping mall. It's, it's not going to, um, you know, there's that educational part that shifts people's perspectives. Okay. So people have this knowledge, um, and yes, that's great. Um, and that will help, but really I, what I am hoping to get people, you know, who are criticizing that idea is that how about look at our, you know, our food system, where are you getting your food? Do you drink coffee? (laughs) Exactly. Drive a motor vehicle. (laughs) How many, 
thousands of acres of yeah. land was destroyed so that you could have your organic kale. Somewhere else, though, where they don't have to see it every day. They don't either. see it, yeah. And they're not, they're displaced from it or they're disconnected. They see it in a beautiful package at the store. And, oh, I didn't hurt anything. I just bought it at the store or at McDonald's or wherever. And they're just so dis and that's the problem is they're disconnected yes they're environmentalists and they're trying to protect the land the land needs protecting but we can't protect something if we don't see value in it yeah yeah you know and oftentimes you brought up the sort of the dirty word the environmentalists because like i man am i do i am i like ever a uh, advocate for wild <laughs> species in wild places but i find sometimes that the people who are the most vocal spend the least time in natural environments. And so I'll, 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 it's like, okay, well, you're saying that about the environment. I'm actually in the environment. Would you like to come with me and I will show you the environment and we can talk about that? Because you're talking about it like it's a metaphorical place or some magical no-no land, you know, where it's like, you, in reality, like you were just saying, all of these things, you know, if you have an iPhone, if you have a car, if you have all these things require tremendous amounts of natural. It's not like this stuff's coming from outer space or something. I mean, it's all coming from our environment. But um, right. it's such an interesting position to take where it's like, well, but in our area, we don't want that. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> right. Sorry. Yeah. And the, they're treating it like nature should be a museum. You know, don't right. touch it. Don't right. interact with it. Stay on the trail. Don't, you know you know, don't touch the flowers, don't touch this and, and stay off. Um, but really what we really need is to be interacting with yeah. it, to play a part in it. And that's the way it's been for forever, you know, since our entire existence on this planet. Yeah. Um, I, Cause I feel like the, yeah. if we go that route, that leave no trace route, the thing is, is then, then you tend to be even more exploitative through those veils we were talking about, because you don't actually like you said, you don't have value placed on any particular species, you know, it's a really amazing, like the more people feel like they can't touch anything, the more, what, then that means, what are they going to touch? They're going to touch all these manufactured things and all these manufactured yeah. things come from somebody else's backyard and <laughs> just not theirs, <laughs> you know? Oh, it's really, yeah. yeah, we're in an interesting place. The other thing I was going to say, I noticed people do is they, they often want like a general rule. So like, give me rules for sustainable foraging. And it's like, man, it's, it's di every species has its own, you know, I think about like, uh, the way we harvest ramps here is like in Maine, we have a very little, we have about a hundred populations of leeks in their wild ramp, uh, ramps in their, their very small population. So when we harvest, we just take one leaf off of each plant. We don't take bulbs the way you could in other areas where they're, you know, they're more dense. Uh, that's our method. But, but I would not say when you forage, only take one leaf. Like that's just that plant. Or when I harvest milkweed, right. it's like I take the flowers off milkweed, but I, I never denude a plant. So if a plant has five umbels, I'll take one or two, but make sure I leave two or three for monarch butterflies, for instance. Or So every plant has its own thing. And I, I find that people sometimes are like, oh no, I just want general rules. Um, do you have any general rules you teach people or, or do you find something similar there? Um, yeah, people like general rules. Um, and the best I can say is, you know, don't take the first plant you see, make sure that there's others and take only, um, no, you know, take no more than 10 to 15% of a plant. Um, you know, if you don't have to, um, kill the plant in your harvest, like, you know, if you, unless you're pulling up roots, which I try my best to stay away from any root plants. Um, you know, taking berries is totally fine. Uh, taking some leaves and, um, you know, if you're have the mentality that you're pruning, you know, so you're encouraging more growth, mm -hmm. you're, um, yeah. you know, leaving it better than you found it. Um, but really, yeah, people really like general guidelines, but with, foraging and especially with mushrooms you know with with mushrooms people are always like well what are the things you look for to know if it's a deadly mushroom and it's like <laughs> turn it um, over there's a little yeah. there's a little tag on the bottom that says warning <laughs> <laughs> right look for the warning sign um <laughs> but really it's that's nature's way of really drawing us in deep with it uh really to get to know the plants. It's not just, okay, here's your three rules and you're good. This is all you need to know. It's, 
you have to get into it. You have to develop an intimate connection with mm. the different species, the different ecosystems and how they interact with each other. Um, and I think that's what's so fascinating is that you're, you're being invited into this world that you then get to play a part of. Yeah, like an actual participant. So much of what we do, it's like, go watch a movie and it's sort of like, you're just a uh, sedentary and sitting there. You're not actually an interactive <laughs> member. You know, the things already right. happen. Like you're just a spectator. And that's what drives me crazy about so much of the like, don't touch any nature, leave no trace stuff, which I want to say just a caveat for people who are like, wait, you're crazy. It's important. It's like, I do agree it's important. And there's a lot of places where they, it can't handle the amount of people coming through if everybody's breaking stuff off and picking things out. But but, you know, when we start to remove ourselves, we just become spectators on a planet we're supposed to be an interactive animal on. Uh, but one thing that, we're, that we struggle with, I think, is that we don't have that cultural knowledge passed on to us. You know, we have like this human orphanage story, so many of us, where it's like we've been orphaned from our ancestors who knew the land so well. So we're like relearning all those little things. Like you said, you were being invited into this world. We weren't born into it where people just taught us this stuff I just we just watched it since we were little right. and we learned along the way. And so I feel like as a forager, we're all um, in this time of discovery, even though these things, you know, if we could talk to the indigenous of the landscape where we live, it's like it's not it's not all we're just rediscovering what's already known. But largely anyway, I think sometimes we come up with fresh stuff, but mostly we're just relearning. But like um, that invitation into it. And I also wanted to say. When I come up over like, let's say a little knoll and I see like a destroying angel and it's like in the sunlight just right, I feel like um, hypnotized by it. <laughs> I feel like a golem with the ring a little bit. Like I'm mm. just, when it's like just shining bright white there in the forest floor right. and I could see just being like, I just want to try it though. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but, uh, you know, it takes that that's hence the cultural knowledge because somewhere along the way someone did. And then, you know, we learn and then you get like told by the people around you in your community. But we don't have that. So everybody's so right. afraid, you know, um, you heard any horror stories Any got any foraging horror stories? I did have a student once in my class who was very interested in wild foods and um, she had a, a young family, a couple of kids, I think, under five and she had found some greens that had popped up in her garden and I uh, was so excited about it she's like oh I, this looks like wild spinach and so she decided to throw it in a blender um, and make a smoothie for everybody in her family and they all drank it and within the next 30 minutes they all were nearly unconscious and couldn't move, paralyzed, wow. um, throwing up. And yeah, even the like, I think two and three year olds. And turns out, uh, and this was before she had come to my class, and she's like, oh, what is that plant? Because that's the plant that I <laughs> fed my family. And I said, this is tree tobacco and it's really poisonous. Is it the and, nicotine in it? Um, I, uh, uh, I'm, uh, let's see, there is a compound in it, not nicotine, there is nicotine in it, but it is not, you would not want to be smoking right, this plant. Right, right, okay. Um, <laughs> but I forget the exact compound in it. Uh, You're but, like, you fed that to your family? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, they probably could have died had there been yeah. a higher dose uh, and so I, I understand the enthusiasm, but definitely, you know, folks just have to take it one at a, you know, one species at a time, get to learn one plant at a time. Um, but yeah, that's my toxic plant horror story that luckily wasn't me and my personal experience, but, and it was, sad, I mean, sad that they had to go through that, but I think they, they really learned but it didn't scare them off surprisingly they were there they wanted to learn more and keep going and um get it right we had uh, we had somebody here 
I'm like, I hate when I do that. I, I'll laugh. It's like that graveyard humor thing. I'll, I'm laughing, but it's not funny. So I, I don't mean, <laughs> I'm laughing because of like, oh man, the world's a crazy place. But uh, there was like a church group up here and they were camping. Some of the kids, they were a band, I think. They were coming to, to you know, like a Christian band or something. And they were camping and they dug up a root that smelled like parsnip. I think it was probably... Mm. Um, uh, poison hemlock but anyway uh they dug it up and it smelled like parsnip and they said they dared one of the kids to eat it and he died from it actually oh, and no. you know it's just like one of those things where i imagine he had to choke something pretty awful down for that to happen but everybody kind of you know egging him on to do it and you know i don't i don't actually have any real good poison mushroom stories you'd think <laughs> there'd be more of them but i think people are much more careful because <laughs> like you yeah. said every time i offer somebody who's never had wild mushrooms wild mushrooms i mean they always are like are you sure how do i right. know show it to me again <laughs> show it to me in a book like <laughs> very little trust on that but yeah right. it's really fascinating um what about um in the era of covid have you been finding um any wild medicines to be particularly useful or even just as preventatives um, preventatives, I, I, you know, just be outside, be outside yeah. <laughs> without yeah. a mask on, uh, breathing. <laughs> Wait, I don't <laughs> need my mask when I'm outside. Are you sure? Cause I see not a lot of people do not agree with you. Uh, no, no, that is not the popular opinion. Um, but that I think is one of the best things that you can do. Uh, getting that vitamin D, you know, from yeah. the sun, being outside and not limiting your immune system. Um, yeah, that's, that is going to be the biggest thing. Um, and, you know, antivirals, you know, your elderberry is, is really good, t t you know, in general for antiviral. Um, I haven't had anybody in my near family get sick. So I haven't had the opportunity to treat anybody. Oh, gotcha. But, yeah. Um, Almost everybody I know who's contracted it has had very, very mild symptoms. I mean, I actually have been surveying everyone around me now for, I guess it's been a year. Like, hey, who do you know who's had COVID and what were the outcomes? And I mean, it is very rare that anybody in my circle or extended out two or three levels has had any really serious health problems if they were, you know, under the age of, let's say, 85 or something. I just don't hear too much. Um, yeah. But, you know, everybody got the double masks on out there in the... Right, right. <laughs> out there outside. I imagine a lot more so where you are, too. It seems like it's been pretty crazy out there. It is It is a strange world now, yes. <laughs> um, um, it, the idea, it's interesting because, like, health freedom, you know, it's like the idea that you could just decide for yourself how you wanted to take care of yourself, but I guess that's sort of old world thinking these days. <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, you're like, dude, get me off this topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, uh, it's a touchy one for a it's, lot of people. It's, divi so. it's divisive, of course. Yeah. It is. It's, it's yeah. hard. Cause like, uh, well, I, I guess I'm just taking us deeper into the topic. So let me shift gears <laughs> for a second. <laughs> Talk to me about um, on the food side, because you also, um, you're cooking as well, You not just uh, harvesting? Yeah. Um, I, like I mentioned before, I have a you know, background in art and design. And so naturally, when I first came to Wild Food, I was like, this stuff is so ugly. It's, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. it's hard to make a pile of weeds on a plate look really amazing and that it belongs in a five-star restaurant. Uh, so I took that as a challenge. And while I've never been to culinary school, um, I'm probably doing things wrong, <laughs> doing things wrong, but um, I kind of go about it my own way and working with texture, taste, and the visual side, uh, what looks good together, what, you know, what kind of story you can tell through a dish or through a, a full eight course meal. You know, it's a, it's a story. It's a connection, connecting the person to the land through the food and doing that through visual storytelling, through visual, um, you know, the experience, the sounds, and then the taste, and then, you know, how that feels in the body too. So it's, it's definitely a multi-experience, multi, -experience, multi 
sensorial experience, um, which really brings home the the concept of connecting to the land. And um, yeah, I, I don't have any intention to opening a restaurant um, or doing anything on a big scale. Uh, it's it's more of this is in a way it's kind of a performance art, you know, it's an yeah. educational experience yeah. and hard to repeat immersing. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Every event I do, every dinner I do is, is completely different. Oh, so um, that's what you do. You, you host, uh, dinners. Yeah. Oh, okay. Tell me about it. Yeah. Um, I do. Well, I didn't do any last year because of, of the situation, um, in the world. But before that I was doing a, a probably couple full size dinners a year. Um, and then every month or so I would do a wild food tasting where I would take people out. We'd go look at plants, talk about them, and then come back and I would serve a three to five course tasting menu, uh, with beverages. So they get to, they just met the plants in their environment and then they come back and they see the potential of what that plant can be. Oh, so they uh, went out as as well. Yeah. They go out and see it. You know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about how important story is to people when it comes to food. Well, you know, obviously storytelling being like one of the most ancient things that we do. And um, thinking about how this is known in certain worlds, like um, if you were going to drink high-end wine, you know, they always send mm-hmm. the somm- sommelier out to the table who tells right. you a story while you drink it. And and part of the price you're paying is the story, right? Because I think if we're really honest with ourselves, most of us, you know, might be able to tell a $5 wine from a $50 wine, but most of us can't tell a $50 wine from a $1,000 wine. There's like a diminishing return, right? So you need somebody to come out and tell you a story about a place and about Mm -hmm. the sun and about the soil and about the plants. And like this whole story adds value in your mind. Also, I noticed like if you go to McDonald's, you can pay 99 cents for a burger. But if you go to like a nice hipster place where they're going to tell you about the farm and how they raise mm-hmm. the cows and the name of the farmers and, you know, pictures of the staff, all of that story suddenly makes that a $20 burger, you know? Exactly. I mean, obviously it's more than the story, but that be the story is important to people perceiving the value. And then I've been thinking about how really I can't think of a time in history that's ever existed except for a very small elite group of individuals anywhere in human history where people wouldn't have known the story of their food or at least most of their food. It's a really weird time where people are so dissociated from their environment that they actually don't even, because have you noticed this other thing where it's like most people who haven't ever gardened before wouldn't even recognize the plants that they eat all the time. If they saw them in a garden, you know, fully grown (laughs) or it's like, or when they see them, they're like, that's what it looks like. I've never seen a, oh, broccoli. Oh, I never, I never saw one before. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, Yeah. There's such a disconnection and it's strange because it's, this is, this disconnection is so new to human history. We've always known our, our food. We know where they come from. We know how it's grown. That was part of us but it's just in these last say 100 years that we outsource our food to corporations and businesses that you know disconnect purposely and i think in a way disconnect us from Mm -hmm. where our food is coming from and you know no wonder we're seeing so much illness so much disease that you know we're we're eating stuff that the not even real food anymore. It's become mm-hmm. so processed and, and preserved and altered that our bodies barely recognize it as food anymore. I'm a, I make maple syrup here at my house and um, I, ha- I do it pretty old school. Like, you know, I hang a metal bucket on every tree and I carry the sap by hand in buckets, uh, my wife and I, and, you know, we cook it down in a metal pan and, we, you know, we do it sort of in a more traditional way and um to because it's for us and people will say like hey man will you sell me a quart of that maple syrup and it's like D- you couldn't afford it and you know right? like come on yes like it's like no I, because of what i would want for it <laughs> because of how much work went into making it but when i notice like when you put economics on it because i look at the people who produce maple syrup commercially i mean i'm in an area where you know new england's where it, it's all happening here and in quebec and once it's an economic thing then the corners that people cut that you wouldn't want to necessarily do for yourself, 
suddenly it's like a lot of plastic and all this like pumping and all of these sensors and all this mechanics. And it becomes this thing where you're like, you see how food gets degraded once somebody's trying to get a profit on it, you know? And that's the challenge I think with wild foods. I'm curious how you feel about that. Cause I think, you know, we're also in the era of commercial foraging, which because the other interesting thing too, is like, if you go to really high end restaurants, that's another thing I always find interesting about wild food is like, you know how you said before, like wild food can, look kind of ugly sometimes but then when you go to really high-end restaurants there's always wild food there you know whether it's mushrooms or it's you know it's seafood or it's whatever there's um a desire for chefs to have wild food and then there's a desire from wealthy folks to eat wild food right it's like prestige in a way um but anyway, so here we are in this era where it's like, I'm grateful that there's wild foods available. I mean, I think that's cool. I'm glad that there's people who get to commercial forage, but then also that's how we lost so many species of animals. That's how we lost the passenger pigeon, you know, and <laughs> almost wiped out buffalo is like when there's a commercial yeah. value placed. Because I agree with what you were saying before, like we, it's so important that we value a thing or else we tend to lose it or stop paying attention till we lose it. But mm-hmm. then if we put too much value on it, wow, then we start to like... Mm, do a lot of sketchy things in order to like extract that value. Uh, so I'm curious how you feel about commercial foraging. Um, I don't have a, I, I see, I'm sort of mixed on this, so I'm not trying to guide you one way or the other in your <laughs> answer here. Like, but, uh, yeah, just curious how you feel about the whole thing. And, um, and, and this, this draw for wild foods in the, in the restaurant industry. Um, yeah, it's, uh, interesting thing. Um, I did spend some time uh, in 2019 uh, foraging for a few restaurants and some really high-end chefs, which were quite a pleasure to work with in LA. And also kind of a smaller startup restaurant that they were very passionate about wanting to incorporate wild food in their um, in their cuisine and but they were they weren't catering to you know the higher end folk they were more um, it was a neighborhood they wanted to serve the neighborhood and I really loved their concept but you know they didn't quite grasp that like how much time and effort it would take mm-hmm. to to forage for that amount because that you know they were serving a lot of people every day and and you're doing you know, the processing. I was I was collecting. I was I offered to process some things for them, but they were like, "Oh no no no, we got it, we got it." And I'm like, "Do oh, you guys nice. really know what you're doing?" And <laughs> especially when it came to um, acorns, they're like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna do some acorn an acorn dessert." I forget what exactly it was, but um, you're, you're just like, "Really?" <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, okay, so I harvested. I collected over 200 pounds of acorns for them. And, you know, it, it took quite some time to do that. And I said, what do you, how are you guys going to process these in, in your kitchen? And they're like, oh, we got it. No problem. Don't worry. So I come back the next week and I said, how'd those acorns go? I mean, for me, that takes a, that takes a lot of manpower takes me about to. Ten, 10 days to yield something edible out of, a, out of right. an acorn. And, well, they didn't even get to that point. They, I said, okay so how did you do this and they well we kind of messed up a little bit oh no (laughs) what happened well we thought it was a good idea to put them all in the driveway and then just drive over them to shell them okay with our car and i said so you don't have any more acorns do you (laughs) no (laughs) okay (laughs) so yeah, there is the desire to have these exotic foods and there's a I think a misconception that you know oh they're just like our other stuff we buy from our suppliers. No, it's different. You have to treat them. They have different processing methods. They have different ways to use them that um so yeah, a little bit of education was missed there. Well, we're so again like you we were, we've been talking about the dissociation people have today from food and from wild ecosystems. And I think like, if you look, I think lettuce is such a good example. Like if you look at a wild lactuca, it's a medicinal plant, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's got edible phases, but it's also like an 
opium substitute. <laughs> you know, it's like a right. medicinal plant. And then when you domesticate that plant and you breed all that medicine out, then you yield a thing that's just like huge and watery and edible. And then people don't know that that, you know, thousand years of, of horticulture has taken place. And they just think like, and, and this is where it gets interesting to me because herbalism is really the art of using those compounds in the wild plants that have been bred out of the domestic plants, you know? So like yeah. people don't realize a lot of times, you know, cause imagine how different the world would be if you could just pick acorns up and eat them. Right. Like what would be, I mean, what would have never needed to have happened? Like we would have whole cultures subsisting on acorns if it was that simple to eat acorns. If it was like, exactly. You know, yeah, we wouldn't be so dependent on, you know, wheat and grains and we'd be sitting around eating acorns all the time. Um, but there is a couple species uh, in the Southwest that you don't really require any leaching at all. And you can pretty much just crack them and eat them on the spot. And those are pretty special acorns. <laughs> what acorns are you talking about? Uh, the emery acorn, the uh, Quercus emorii. Yeah, I'm going to look that up because my botanist friend always tells me that, that any of the a acorns that people eat unleached still have the tannins, but that they don't taste the tannins, but that they're still having the anti-nutrient effect. So I want, I'm curious. I'm going to look into that because I'd be curious. Oh. Have you heard anything about that? Um, I mean, I can. I would imagine there probably still is some tannins in there for sure. Uh, but, you know, we're you consuming them. we're consuming tannins when we're drinking our tea and coffee and yeah. wine. And so... You know, it's, I know folks are pretty scared about tannins and acorns, but we're, we're actually getting quite a bit of tannins anyways in some of the other things. And we like them. Things. <laughs> we do. We do. We like them yeah. very much. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's another interesting component too, because I find with, um, I find a lot of domesticated food to be a little bit bland for my taste. You know, there's mm. just more punch and more interesting flavor. I mean, I, I do find with wild foods, you'll taste things uh, like I know you hang with Pascal, right? It's like yeah. somebody who's like <laughs> pushing the envelope of what flavors a person could even taste is my impression, you know, <laughs> like always like looking for new, really novel kind of experiences in that sense. And man, it's just, it's sort of almost sad, like the color palette people are painting with not knowing how many more colors there are in a sense. Right. I, there are so many new flavors or not new. These flavors have been around forever, but things that we haven't were shielded from when we're eating the same, you know, four ingredients, you know, rice, corn, soy, wheat, and sugar, I guess that's five. But, you know, when we open up our perspective or, you know, food choices, we can try, have new flavors. And, and I find flavors and pretty interesting um, because, you know, we're always, when we try something like, oh, that tastes like chicken, that tastes like strawberries, that tastes like this, but because we have no reference, it's like this all brand new thing. And um, so kind of like getting to know, like, say the saguaro fruit, you mm. know, oh, well, people have all these words to try and describe it. But I'm like, no, that's, that's saguaro fruit. That's what that tastes yeah. like. That's instead of trying to, you know, pull at other things to describe it. It's like, no, that's saguaro fruit taste. That's, that's black trumpet taste. That's, yeah. um, yeah. You know, and yeah, it has these kind of similarities, but um, I feel like, you know, these things just have their own uniqueness that can be used in different ways and paired in different ways than than what we're used to. And, and really, I mean, there's so much more that we can do that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface with. Yeah, my friend Alan Burgo calls it the uh, the final frontier of food. And I, I always <laughs> find that, I find that I'm sort of mixed on that because I'm like, in a way, it's the oldest frontier of food. But then for right. our culture, it really is where, you know, from, from a culinary perspective, it really is like the final frontier. I really appreciate what you just said about taste because I spend so much time. I mean, it's the inevitable question. What's that taste like? It's like having yeah. tattoos. Everybody's like, did that hurt? I'm like, yeah, it <laughs> sure did. Uh, it definitely hurt. Um, right? You know, but I get asked that 20 times a day. And whenever I'm talking about wild foods, like, well, what's, what's that taste like? What's this taste like? What's that? So I'm going to just start telling them it tastes like the thing it is. <laughs> right. As, as yeah, and, and, <laughs> well, it's a lack of experience. You know, it's a lack of mm -hmm. having that experience to draw from. And um, 
you know, as, as children, you know, we're, we eat an apple for the first time and like, oh, that's an apple. That's what an apple tastes like. And so then we have that reference for the rest of our life. Um, and then when we're coming to wild foods as an adult, then we're, you know, grasping at these other ways to explain it and, um, exp- you know, going off of our old experiences. When I was a kid, though, I thought there was only like five different types of fruit, you know, <laughs> Gr- growing up in New England, like just standard American diet. I was like, OK, there's apples, there's pears, there's oranges, there's lemons, there's bananas like that. That's everything. Right. Like slowly, right. slowly. And then I remember being like, I want to try all the fruits. So I try all the fruits in the supermarket. <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm going to go to some other countries and try fruits. And then real quick, you're like, oh, <laughs> it's like yeah. en- it's just endless, you know, and then you get into wild foods. You're like, oh, a- every flowering plant makes a fruit like I'll never be able to try all the fruits that's absurd right. you know? I think I was thinking I'll try all the domestic fruits but um tell tell us about what's coming up for you what's um you know you got anything you your book's coming out obviously that's going to be a huge deal for you um you know what do you got planned yeah the book is you know I um uh, a pretty big deal but that was kind of last year's work um so I'm excited to kind of see what's next and where my path is going to take me um and I do have a dinner coming up in uh, Washington in June. So I'm excited to get up there and. Um, All filled up already, or is there availability? It, it sold out within 24 hours. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. So these, these are pretty hard to get into, um, especially now that I'm doing them pretty infrequently. But Where hopefully do you announce things. Them? Um, on my newsletter, I have, I'll send out an email there to to my newsletter and usually that fills up most of it and then I'll put it on my Instagram story. So a lot of times it doesn't even hit my main, um, you know, Facebook or, or Instagram outlets, um, before it sells out. But I do have a, a semi-virtual herbalism program that's coming up in the fall. Um, we do, you know, half on zoom and half in person. Um, so that's going to be a four, uh, sorry, three month long program. Um, I just am in the middle of finishing up my f- wild food portion of that program. Um, so we, I do two different sessions a year. The spring we do wild foods and then in the fall we do herbal medicine. So kind of, I really like to get in deep with some of these concepts and practices. Um, so having a, an extended program helps to do that. Um, rather than just a, you know, two hour workshop on a Saturday, uh, really, you know, and it also, and also builds community, brings people together and brings us group through a journey of learning, you know, wild foods and then, you know, herbal medicine as well. So people need to go to jstarwood.com and get on your newsletter so they can stay yes. aware of your, uh, of your dinners. And then your Instagram is at jess.starwood and i suggest people go check that out because you have a i mean just like i said the photography i there's there's not a lot of people in the wild food world i know a couple people so if if you're listening alan i love your photos uh but you know not a lot of people out there who are able to make it look the way you're making it look and i appreciate that one of in our first uh, season of wild fed on the tv show there's this moment where I say like part of why I'm making this show is because when I talk about wild food, people just picture like twigs and berries. And I'm trying to say, no, <laughs> this is this is the stuff. Right. Like I said, like you go to the finest restaurants in the world, like that's the stuff on the menu. You know, like this is really, really good food. But, uh, you know, and we need to just present it like that. So I just I appreciate how you're approaching it. It's really nice. Thanks. Got any concluding things you want to say to uh, everybody listening? Just be us. Go outside. Take your mask off. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for your time today it's great to meet you sure yeah absolutely it's a pleasure thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast you can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review it ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest which translates directly into better shows more awesome guests and a constant stream of fresh new content Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.